Research Center, Mr. Brent Bozell. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Dr. Yost and Father Fitzgerald, Senator Sessions, and all the distinguished members of Congress who are here tonight, and all of a, a, a room full of, of great friends. Uh, my job is to talk about the, the founding of Americans United for Life. 1971 was a long, long time ago. I was 16, smoking cigarettes, listening to the Beatles, studying and relishing Catholic Spain, and watching as my father and my mother worked tirelessly to save America's soul. Forty years later, I'm no longer young. The Beatles are no longer performing. My parents are no longer with us. I finally quit smoking. Spain quit being Catholic. <laughs> but one constant remains. Today, 40 years and so many millions of tragic lives lost later, we're still fighting to end the national horror of abortion. Today there's light, perhaps not laser beam bright, but certainly not just a glimmer. There's real hope that the Holocaust of abortion could finally end. Don't watch CBS. Don't read Newsweek. Look at the polling data. The majority of Americans are now with us and our numbers are growing by the day. Right. But that's not the way it was in 1971. Then it was almost pure darkness. The cultural left was ascendant, openly challenging the underpinnings of Western civilization with the liberal press serving as its willing megaphone. The Equal Rights Amendment movement was sweeping the country but ultimately would prove Newton's law that for every action there must be an equal and, equ and opposite reaction, that opposite reaction being called Phyllis Schlafly. <laughs> and in the end, she was not equal, she was mightier. <laughs> there was the ACLU banishing the Almighty from the public square and the public classroom, while Time Magazine earnestly hoped on its cover is God dead? And there was the unthinkable, the very real possibility that the United States Supreme Court would make it legal, a right to destroy unborn human life. In state after state, the pro-abortion forces were on the march, crafting new state laws through the legislative process while their legal allies were on the prowl with one case after another, winding its way through the courts challenging existing laws restricting abortion as being unconstitutionally vague. The pro-life movement, such as it was in 1971, was passionate but minuscule and already fractured. Many conservatives assumed there was an unbroken continuity between Western political tradition steeped in Catholic faith and American constitutional law. Why surely then, the culture of abortion, of death, could not survive if challenged on con constitutional grounds. Surely the high court would eventually hold that innocent unborn life was protected by the Constitution. This was the position advanced by the pro-life movement's most visible leadership, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Others saw it otherwise. Like it or not, the Supreme Court could conclude the U.S. Constitution, far from guaranteeing the sanctity of unborn life, instead guaranteed the right of mothers and doctors to choose to terminate lives in the womb. As these pro-lifers read the signs of the times, the unborn in America were far more likely to find the federal courts and their reading of the Constitution a trap rather than a sanctuary. The intellectual leadership of this position was advanced primarily by the editors of Triumph Magazine. My father foresaw something else. He saw that the culture of death needed to be opposed on a far broader battlefront in a, and in a far more fundamental way than wrangling over radically contradictory interpretations of the 14th Amendment. It was his opinion, shared by the editors of the magazine, that the pro-life movement needed to be a truly grassroots uprising and men and women of all faiths committed to a long political, legal, educational, and moral struggle, not only in the lobbies of Capitol Hill, but in the 50 states 
to nurture and reinforce a culture of life inspired by a vision of a nation in which everyone is welcomed in life and protected in law. On February 5, 1971, the Triumph editors and pro-life leaders that were working then were called call for a National Right to Life Congress in Washington, D.C., inviting representatives from all known grassroots organizations to participate in the national public conversation. From the earliest days of the pro-life movement, the organizational energy had been provided by the Catholic Church. But while it was gratifying to see the church show leadership, this alone did not a movement make. My father and other lay Catholic leaders argued for the formation of a truly ecumenical organization, independent of church control, and representative of the broad swath of pro-life opinion in America, including that which argued for an organization with the intellectual and legal mandate to fight the coming legal battles. Some within the church political leadership saw this move as threatening, and after a ferocious and equally unfortunate dispute, the National Right to Life Congress was abandoned. But the concept wasn't. In August of 1971, Americans United for Life was officially launched. Tonight, we celebrate her 40th anniversary as a premier and absolutely indispensable legal and intellectual arm of the pro-life movement. There's much good news on this front. We salute and we thank Charmaine Yost and her incredible staff. They are well deserving of the plaudits. But let us also honor and celebrate her founders and the earliest leadership of this most noble of noble causes. How lonely it was back then. There was no Fox News to provide our side with a hint of equal coverage. There was no talk radio with, through which to converse with millions. There was no internet to mobilize the masses. There was Triumph Magazine and Human Events and The Wanderer and a couple of little publications and direct mail, and that's about it. But they had something else. They had the Holy Spirit, and through the Holy Spirit, the indomitable passion to save lives. So let us salute Nellie Gray, who out of nothing created national marches. <laughs> with tens of thousands freezing year after year, showcasing a movement that refused to die. Let us salute men like Henry Hyde and Larry Hogan, for tirelessly waging the lonely legislative battles in Congress, while Larry's brother Bill so effectively served as the national spokesman for the cause, and men like Michael Lawrence here tonight, so eloquently presented the defense, the defense of the unborn in print. Let us salute George Hudson Williams, AUL's first chairman, along with all who followed in his footsteps. Let us salute all those pastors and priests and rabbis and nuns and counselors who fought relentlessly to reverse the tide of the death culture. I was 16. Forty years later, I'm sincerely grateful for the honor of publicly thanking my parents. It is their dedication to this noble cause, more than anything else in their natural lives, that convinces me they're enjoying an eternity in paradise. Thank you.